Anyone who regularly rides the metro rail system in Washington, D.C. is familiar with the inconvenience caused by the necessary track work required to keep the system safe and in working order. Over the next few minutes, I'm going to take you on a behind-the-scenes tour showing you what it takes to keep the over 800,000 people who ride the 116 miles of track through 86 metro rail stations every day moving. This video was shot over Labor Day weekend 2008 when Metro performed one of the largest maintenance projects we've ever attempted, shutting down both tracks between the National Airport and Braddock Road stations. A shutdown was requested so that we could replace the running rail and wooden ties in areas where walls and other obstructions prevent normal tie replacement. Had we not been able to have a shutdown, the work would have taken 60 to 65 eight-hour shifts to replace the wooden ties and another 7 to 10 shifts to replace the rail. Allowing only one shift per day to work, which is overnight when the system is closed, this project would have taken almost three months to complete. As in any project, safety is a major concern. For this project, the first task was to remove a 60-foot section of third rail. Why 60 feet, you ask? Great question. A metro rail car is 75 feet long and the two metal paddles called collector shoes that touch the third rail are located under the front and rear doors on each car, which are 40 feet apart. This way, should a rail car accidentally pass into the work area, the collector shoes would not be able to complete an electrical circuit between a live area and the work area, energizing it and possibly causing harm to our workers. Of course, as you can see, all workers in the construction area are required to wear hard hats, high visibility vests, and safety glasses. When work in a construction area begins, power is cut to the third rail by removing the circuit breaker. A red tag is placed on the breaker to alert anyone entering the room that the breaker should not be pushed back in. In track work areas, you will always see a yellow box with a white light. This box connects to the third rail and is grounded by the running rail. Should the third rail ever become energized, this box will sound an alarm and the strobe light will flash alerting workers to the power. You will also see red flags located at each end of the work area. This is to designate to any train operator that may accidentally travel past the posted zone that they are about to enter a work area and should stop immediately. In the main work area, 1,600 feet of track was cut up into 20-foot sections called panels and removed from the track bed with a crane which loaded the panels onto a flatbed rail car on the opposite track. These panels were then moved out of the work area and taken from the flat car and stored for further disassembly and disposal. Next, the stones or ballast was removed and leveled to allow for the placement of the new rail ties. Because this work area had concrete walls on either side, the ballast was pushed against the walls as much as possible. Then, the extra was placed in special ballast cars or dumped over the edge in piles out of the way so that it could be retrieved later. Moving the ballast is a precise project. It is leveled and measured to ensure the new railroad ties and tracks are installed in the correct height and grade. Railroad ties are then placed on the smoothed ballast. These are also measured and placed in 400-foot sections. When a 400-foot section of wooden ties was complete, the running rail, which was stored on the opposite track, was moved into position. Yes, the rail looks like a giant piece of spaghetti until it is fastened to the ties, which is the next step. For this project, the fastener plates were attached to the wooden ties prior to them being put into position. The rail was placed on the plates and held into position with fasteners. Now that the rails are attached to the ties, it's time to secure everything in place with additional ballast. Remember the rocks we moved earlier? Well now it's time to put them back. Ballast cars are used to dump the rocks around the rails. Another machine called a regulator is also used to move the rocks away from the walls and into the track bed. Once the rocks are dumped, we use the regulator again to smooth them out. It has a rotating brush just like a giant street sweeper which moves the ballast into position down in between the wooden ties. Can you say magic fingers? Well, sort of. The next process is called tamping and uses another machine called you guessed it, a tamper. This machine forces giant vibrating fingers around the wooden ties and lifts the track up just a smidge to vibrate the rocks, causing them to settle in, holding the ties securely. 
Flash. No, it's not an old-time picture. It's called thermite or CAD welding, and it's used to fuse together pieces of the third rail and grounding cables to the running rail. Don't blink, there it is again. Once the welds are cool, they are ground down and smoothed out so collector shoes can cross over them without any problem. Now that all of the rails are in place, it's time to put the finishing touches on everything. The safety cover for the third rail is attached and the electronics are installed. Because this is an aerial structure, an additional piece of iron is installed. This is called an emergency guardrail. If a train wheel should come off the track, this guardrail will stop the train from sliding further. The rail replacement took place in the middle of the work area. At one end, another work crew spent their weekend busy removing and replacing the wooden ties while preserving the existing track. This work requires many steps and many pieces of equipment. First, the clips that secure the running rail to the tie plates are removed. Then a crew moves down the track with a motorized piece of equipment that removes the stakes that hold the metal plates that the spring clips were connected to. Following this, a machine is used to lift the rails just enough to get the tie plates out from under it. Bring in the heavy equipment, the wooden ties are pushed and then pulled out from under the rail. New ties are placed with the same machine, pushed into position, and the whole process is reversed. Tie plates are installed. Now though, rather than using the same stakes that were pulled out, giant lag bolts are used, driven into holes drilled into the wooden ties. The rail is secured to the ties with clips. Here come the rocks. Ballast is spread out, and the magic fingers go to work setting the ballast against the ties. Because we wanted to make the most of having the tracks shut down, other crews were also brought in to repair concrete on one of the aerial structures. Crews were used to trim back the vegetation and growth. Surveyors took advantage of the closure to get readings of the location of the tracks. Another aerial structure was pressure washed. And finishing off the weekend work, concrete grout pads, the equivalent of the wooden ties in tunnels and aerial structures were repaired on the bridge just outside National Airport. At the end of the weekend, the work area is cleaned up and inspected a final time. When everything is clear, the site is returned to Revenue Service.